Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the uh, second part of our third year course on structural geology. This lecture will be subdivided into two parts. In the first part, we are talking about boudins and mouillons and competence contrasts in general. In a second lecture on this chapter, we are going to look at uh, competence contrasts and how they control the mechanics of the Earth's crust. What is competence? Competence in general is the resistance of a rock to undergo strain and uh, we are going to talk about essentially the, the ductile field and the brittle ductile transition. And in the ductile field uh, the competence of a rock depends on the plasticity of the most abundant of the rheologically dominant mineral species in a rock. So for instance a rock that is dominated by, by quartz, something like a granitic gneiss, would behave differently uh, compared to a gabbro where the rheologically dominant mineral species might be plagioclase, simply because the plasticity of quartz and feldspar are different. We are coming back to that point in the second lecture on this chapter. The different plasticity of the rheologically important and dominant mineral species has uh, two effects. The first one is that uh, we observe a highly variable rheology in a given rock type if we expose this rock type to different temperatures, say from the sub-green schist to the upper, mid-upper amphibolite facies conditions in, uh, or, or perhaps even higher into the granulite facies. We also might find variable rheology or competence in the field uh, in different rock types at the same place, in the same outcrop. Uh, that were deformed at the same temperature. So at a given temperature, different rocks will have different rheology and that produces competence contrasts at outcrop scale or even at smaller scale. Let's make an example. Look at uh, such a diagram that we already have seen in the second year course with the uh, differential stress plot plotted versus strain uh, on the basis of experimental data. Say a, a given rock A uh, requires at room temperature about uh, 1700 megapascals differential stress to fail. Uh, at 300 degrees we are getting steady state flow at perhaps 1400 megapascals differential stress. And with increasing temperature downward, say to granulite facies conditions, we find a steady state flow already at about 200 megapascals differential stress under these experimental conditions. Let's now have a look at another rock with a different mechanics and uh, now this rock, uh, for instance, at 200 degrees uh, already starts steady state flow at about 1400 megapascals differential stress. And uh, also here these uh, curves are shifted. Now this would mean that at 300 degrees rock A requires higher differential stress for steady state flow than rock B which only might need here 1100 megapascals versus about 1400 in rock A. Uh, this difference is even larger at, larger at 500 degrees Celsius. Here is the curve for 500 degrees in rock A. Here is the curve for 500 degrees in rock B. Again you see here rock B at 500 degrees uh, only requires 500 megapascals versus more than 1000 megapascals in rock A. This clearly means rock B is less competent because under the same medium grade metamorphic conditions it would deform more easily. So between rock A and B if they would occur in green schist and fibrolite facies conditions in the same rock as an interlayered sequence there would be a competence contrast. Rock B would respond less competent to deformation than rock A. If we have in a layered sequence of rocks, uh, rocks of different competence, uh, for instance an interlayering between nice layers and amphibolite layers, we will observe that rheological contrasts during deformation produce uh, characteristic structures and one important structure type that requires competence contrasts are boudins. We are going to discuss mouillons a little bit later. This is what boudins look like when layer parallel extension is uh, happen, happening. We see a semi-brittle or a brittle failure during the breakup of a once coherent, uh, highly competent layer. 
And uh, we are forming these rod-like structures separated by linear gaps, which we call Boudin lines. The gap in between uh, is also called neck. So Boudin lines or neck lines are uh, synonymous. You might come across uh, both of these uh, terms in the literature. When we look at the behavior of the less competent host rock that uh, surrounds such a competent layer, and we see that here in this example uh, where a quartzite layer is uh, disrupted, uh, in, uh, embedded in a, uh, say, shale or in a schist or in a phyllite, you will see that the more ductile host rock is uh, trying to fill the gaps in between these individual boudins by flowing into the uh, necks between the boudins. That normally produces these kinds of uh, fold-like geometries, but they are, in fact, rather a, uh, an attempt to fill the space in between these boudins. Sometimes you also will find uh, precipitation from fluid phases if all that deformation happens in the presence of uh, fluids. These fluids will preferentially go into the necks and there then is uh, find space to precipitate the minerals. There are occasions where such precipitation during extensional events and during the formation boudins have led to ore deposits uh, or precipitated from the fluid present at the time. Gold deposits, for instance, can form like that. You also should note that uh, these processes are independent of scale. You could have that at micro scale, at hand specimen scale, outcrop scale, or even regional scale. So there is no reason why such a layer should not be uh, five, six hundred meters uh, wide. And, uh, and that would then, uh, if, if uh, massive fluid influx uh, containing precious metals uh, are going to precipitate preferentially in between such mega boudins, uh, this could become an ore deposit. This could become a mine. So boudinage uh, can be uh, also an economically uh, important process. Here at the uh, bottom diagram, we see uh, asymmetric boudinage. Uh, here we see that uh, original layering. Here, this layer was once parallel to uh, the main layer that we see here. That these boudins rotated after the breakup into individual bodies. And again, uh, please keep in mind that these are rods. This is not a two-dimensional. These are three-dimensional structures that we see here. Such rotation of uh, individual boudins after the breakup of the competent layer is interpreted as non-layer parallel extension. So as soon as you extend not parallel to the competent layer but oblique to it, the result will be that after boudinage, the individual um, boudins will, will rotate. There are uh, similar structures like uh, boudinage or two boudinage, these are called pinch and swell structures. And here at the bottom, we see a typical pinch and swell. Pinch and swell is simply a precursing stage to real boudinage. We see here that the competent layer is still connected at a pinched uh, domain, at a pinched area in between the layers in between what is going to become uh, boudins at a later stage, at a stage of uh, more intense stretching. In uh, pinch and swell situations, uh, we, we had not accumulated enough uh, extensional strain, and therefore uh, the individual boudin bodies are not yet separated. Therefore, we will not call them boudins. We will call the, these here pinch and swell structures. One important feature of the pinch and swell, uh, which in the name is a little bit misleading, we are not swelling actually here. Uh, the thickness of a layer that you measure here is um, to a maximum as thick as the layer initially was. It might even have undergone some uh, vertical thinning, but simply not as much as in the pinched part of the layer. So the pinch and swell is just a descriptive term. It looks as if we here have a thickening and here a thinning. This is not correct. We might have here either constant layer thickness or minor thinning. And along the pinched parts, we have intense thinning. 
Along such a layer, you actually might see that some of these bodies already have separated from their neighboring bodies, and that would then be uh, the transition to boudinage. Here again, we see an uh, example of oblique extension that uh, causes the rotation of such boudins. The rotation sense is uh, not trivial to uh, determine. Uh, sometimes you can see evidence in the field. But uh, in what direction such an individual boudin would rotate depends largely on the orientation of the stress and strain field acting on such a layer. Uh, we are coming back to that in the last chapter of uh, the first part of our course in chapter 4, uh, where we talk about uh, the pure and simple shear components and how they uh, act on, on layers and on rocks. Here we see an example of a uh, pinch and swell in the field. You see here this uh, oval body uh, is on this side here still connected to the next one. So this would be pinch and swell. But uh, this layer certainly continued laterally. But uh, here boudinage has happened. And the next uh, boudin equivalent to this one is probably somewhere on the left-hand side out of the picture. Also here we see uh, thicker parts and thinner parts of such veins and uh, we uh, can assume that this layer uh, is uh, uh, possibly a hydrothermal vein which has undergone lateral stretching and has thinned out in places. And uh, here it actually disappears. And uh, in, the outcrop, in the outcrop, we might actually find uh, thickening again, pinch and swell, and boudinage also along this layer. What we see here is a disrupted uh, fold hinge, and uh, we were talking about the transposition of folds. This is a good example. We see here the hooking and the strong thinning of this limb of the fold. And we see here on this limb here pinch and swell. Uh, this gives us already an indication that uh, folding and boudinage and pinch and swell are associated processes. We see that this is true in uh, a few minutes on one of the next slides. Further example from the field, this comes from the George area. Here we see uh, pegmatites, pegmatites about uh, 10, 15 centimeter thick, have undergone pinch and swell extension, layer parallel extension, essentially, because we see the boudins are pretty well in line with their long axis. They have not been rotated. But we also see boudinage here. This pegmatite, once con a continuous dike, uh, has disrupted into individual boudins, which extend into the rock in rod-shaped geometry. In the field, you can see that if you are looking for three-dimensional outcrop. The shape of boudins uh, can vary. So sometimes you find boudins that are uh, more like these here, uh, or also these pinch and swell ones with uh, very acute pointy uh, sides here towards the uh, Buddha on this side or to the uh, pinched part of the pinch and swell structure. Uh, you also might find uh, Buddhas that have a uh, more obtuse angle if you uh, put tangents here on the sides of the Buddha bodies. Or you even find rectangular uh, Buddhas let, that you see here. Uh, this has a meaning, and this can be interpreted, and it can be interpreted in terms of the competence contrast between the uh, softer matrix and the more competent layer. Here we see an illustration of uh, what kind of Boudin shapes would result if we have increasing competence contrasts between the layer, between the white layers and the uh, more foliated host rock. The foliated host rock is always the less competent layer, but the competence contrast increases here from the bottom to the top. So if we start here at the top, uh, highly competent layers in a much softer matrix would simply form mode 1 fractures during lateral extension. And uh, this forms then rectangular bodies. We see here sharp tensile fractures that separate this once coherent um, this one's coherent layer. And we see in continuation with increasing uh, strain the development of what we call a fish head boudin. We see here the uh, curving internal part that looked like an open mouth of a fish, at least to those who have come up with this term. 
And uh, uh, such a geometry indicates high competence contrast between the Boudinard layer and the uh, matrix. If the uh, competence contrast is a little bit smaller, we still might get fish head shape. Uh, and uh, here, the, the mouth, if you want, at increasing progressive strain uh, will get a little bit smaller. And the overall shape is not as rectangular as if we had very high competence contrast. With decreasing contrasts, we get an increasing importance of pinch and swell. We might find boudinage. We might find uh, pinch and swell in layers or along layers. And uh, this is, for instance, what we have seen in the pegmatites on the last slide. Uh, this means that we had here a relatively low competence contrast. An important uh, characteristic that you see and that you can apply in order to determine qualitatively the competence contrasts are simply tangents that you can put onto the size of these boudins. If you end up with, a, with an acute angle, you are dealing with boudins formed under uh, low competence contrasts that would then produce these very pointy uh, boudins. If you have uh, high tangent angles onto the ends of these boudins, uh, you are increasingly looking at, at higher competence contrasts until you end up here with uh, fish head boudins uh, or rectangular, uh, rectangular boudin shapes. If you have no competence contrast uh, between different layers in a rock, uh, so if your rocks happen to have the same competence, you will find uniform thinning, uniform stretching of the uh, different layers. So uh, the, uh, say, phyllite layers and here uh, another rock type embedded in such uh, layers would uh, stretch at a uniform uh, magnitude and a uniform rate, and that would mean zero competence contrast. That means you can actually look at different rock types, and if you have some idea about how a certain rock should behave uh, compared to another one at a green schist facies temperature, then you can um, draw conclusions about the deformation temperature during the deformation during the formation of the boudins. For instance, if you know that amphibolites in the green schist facies are highly competent rocks uh, and cannot undergo plastic deformation, but a phyllite uh, certainly can, then you would expect in the green schist facies at relatively low temperatures uh, amphibolites to form uh, these kinds of rectangular uh, boudins because they are highly competent, they only can fracture, they cannot undergo ductile deformation in the green schist facies, um, whereas the quartz dominated uh, phyllite uh, certainly will be able to do that. If you then bring that uh, same amphibolite and that metapelite into the upper amphibolite facies, you might find that uh, then the amphibolite indeed is plastic. It is much softer. And in the amphibolite facies, uh, it will form perhaps pinch and swell. Uh, these kinds of uh, boudins, uh, because the competence contrast at these temperatures between a metapelite, which then would be probably a, a paranise, and an amphibolite layer is much smaller. So learn something about the rheology of different rocks at different temperatures, and that will allow you from the shape of boudins to draw some conclusions about the temperature at which the boudinage happened. So here we see how boudinage is related to folding, and often that is uh, the case. It is not necessarily so, but very often we find boudinage on the limbs of folds. And uh, there are two important types of, uh, of boudinage related to folding, and that depends essentially on the mode of strain. We see here simple rod-like uh, boudins that are developed on the limbs of folds. Uh, please note we see no boudinage in the hinges of such fold. And here we see a different pattern, which is called the chocolate block boudinage, uh, with boudins forming not in forms of rods, but usually in some sort of uh, rectangular bodies. And uh, here we see not only one neckline, like here, we see two necklines, roughly perpendicularly to each other. So uh, how does that work? We see here the situation of the formation of a standard type of uh, 
normal Buddhas and chocolate block Buddhas related to the strain that is imposed onto the limbs of such falls. And we see here shown in red arrows the uh, direction of uh, maximum shortening. And we see here as a blue arrow the stretching direction. And if uh, you have one shortening direction and one stretching direction, and in the uh, third dimension we uh, do not have any strain, then we would form rod-like boudins. If we now have two stretching directions, uh, that means uh, one stretching direction as indicated here and another one as indicated here, then we would have uh, a different mode of strain where we would form two necklines, two um, fractures, two fractures that lead to uh, the formation of these chocolate block patterns. These two uh, modes of strain, they correlate with uh, what we know as the plane strain or as the oblate flattening strain. You might remember the Flynn diagram. Here we have the ratios between the strain axis, the uh, strongest stretch, and the intermediate stretch axis. And here the intermediate stretch axis over the axis of maximum shortening. That is what we know as uh, the Flynn diagram that describes the mode of strain, the shape of the strain ellipsoid. Here in the case of uh, standard boudinage, of the classical uh, boudinage with one neckline, we would be roughly along the line of plane strain because only here we keep the intermediate strain axis constant, constant in magnitude. And uh, this direction would be here along this neckline. We are not stretching in this direction. We only stretch in that direction and we compensate for this stretching in a perpendicular direction to it, roughly perpendicular. So here we uh, now see the oblate deformation and uh, you know that in the oblate field we have two stretching axes. S1 and S2 are stretching at equal proportions. Uh, that means we are along this line here with a ratio of S1 over S2 remaining zero. And this stretching is compensated by shortening perpendicular to it. And uh, that is what we would observe here. We would here sh have shortening perpendicularly to the limb and stretching um, parallel to the limb in two uh, directions that are uh, at right angles to each other. We see here in uh, illustrations from uh, Nelson Abbey from the University of Massachusetts uh, further structures that might be related to uh, chocolate block and other types of boudinage. Here we see the chocolate block boudinage, again S1 equals S2 and here S2 in this direction equals S1. So these two strain axes have the same magnitude and they are stretching. We are shortening perpendicular to these two directions parallel S3 and that produces our chocolate block pattern. If we would have markers, say veins or any other kind of structures, layers, uh, perpendicular to the boudinage layer, we would produce symmetric folds. This is illustrated here and these symmetric folds also would have hinge lines perpendicular to each other. Here we indicate these uh, red layers and also these red layers are boudinaged as indicated here on top of this, of this illustration. In the plane strain situation, that means uh, we have a S2 axis remaining constant during the deformation process. S3 is shortening, S1 is stretching. We get the rod-like Buddhas and uh, layers that are perpendicular to the boudinage layers, again, would undergo symmetric folding. Here now we see a third type of boudinage that is not very common in uh, nature, but uh, which theoretically can uh, exist. That is pure constriction, prolate strain leading to boudinage. And again, here we have the prolate strain configuration. We are stretching parallel S1, and we are equally uh, shortening parallel S2 and S3. So S2 and S3, the short 
ones now are equally short. In this direction, our block is getting shortened. And we produce here boudins that are rod-shaped. But these rods have undergone folding because of the shortening parallel S2. S2 no longer as constant as it was here. That is why we could not fold these rods in the uh, plane strain case. Another point that is uh, fairly important to consider in the field is the fact that you sometimes get folds which are overprinting already boudinage layers. And this is recognizable if you look at the situation in hinges. Here, for instance, you see in this hinge boudins. Also here you see boudinage in the hinge of this fold. And that tells you that the boudinage here is not related to the folding because uh, when we scroll back a few slides, we see here that neither normal boudinage nor chocolate block boudinage will form boudins in the hinge of the folds if this fold is related, related to the boudinage process. So watch out in the field whether you are seeing boudins in the hinges of folds, then you know you are folding here already boudinaged layers, and the boudinage itself has nothing to do with the uh, folding process. Mouillons, sometimes called mullions, whatever you like, are often related to boudinage during folding, and we see here the illustration of boudins and mouillons here in the hinge zone of this fold, we see here a strong axial plane cleavage in a less competent layer. The competent layer obviously here has undergone a simple boudinage, rod-like boudinage, plane strain type boudinage. And uh, here we see these oval bodies forming in the hinge of this, of this fold. And uh, again, this is a product of lateral shortening and stretching as indicated here. This would thicken the competent layer here in the hinge, but uh, would stretch the layer in the direction of the actual surface, which is indicated here by the actual surface cleavage. So here we would expect to find the mouillons, and they grade slowly into boudins when you come from the hinge towards the limb. Here are the characteristics of mouillons, rod-shaped geometry, uh, and it is formed always in the hinge zone. It's frequently associated with such boudins on the limbs. We have seen that it requires high competence contrast between the layer that forms the mouillon and the matrix, the underlying and overlying uh, layers. It also requires, to some extent, plastic flow in the competent layer because you have to thicken. You have to stretch the mouillon in this direction. Here we see a field example, which is a very popular image on the internet. You will find it on many websites. Originally, to my knowledge, it comes from Belois College. Here we see these rod-like mouillons. They are slightly overlapping here because this is a situation that would be not right in the center of the hinge. It would be on the transition to the, to the limb, to the fold limb. And if you are lucky to go to honors, uh, you might have the opportunity to see, uh, to see such mouillons in the field. Uh, we find them on uh, Hamsberg in the Maqualand. And let's hope that uh, the outcrop has not been converted into a large open pit mine uh, by the time you will get there. What we can summarize for boudins, mouillons, and competence contrasts is that we can use field characteristics to at least uh, semi-quantify or uh, qualify the rheological contrast between uh, less and more competent layers in the field. The shape of boudins will clearly indicate whether we are dealing with a high competence contrast between the layer and the, uh, between the competent layer and the less competent layer, or whether the competence contrast is rather limited. For competent layers, we would find more rectangular or fish head boudins. For smaller competence contrasts, we would find pinch and swell or boudins that are very pointy, that, are, uh, that have a very acute uh, tangent, tangent angle here at the tips of these boudins. 
The same applies to Moyons. If we see here fairly flat and narrow rods which are stretched considerably parallel to the actual plane surface, then we can assume that here was uh, a certain plasticity and a high strain has been accumulated. But in order to form these uh, fractures between the Boudin, between the Mouillon bodies, between the individual rods, we require a significant competence contrast between the more plastic uh, environment, the more plastic uh, under and overlying rocks, and the more competent uh, layer 